Justice, Admiral Mike Mullen, made a searing indictment of the U.S. strategic communication plan with the Muslim world as he correctly diagnosed, and I quote, no amount of public relations would establish credibility of American behavior if American behavior is perceived to be arrogant, uncaring, and insulting. Admiral Mullen further noted that the communication problems which had been identified by the bureaucrats in Washington are really not problems of communication, but problems of policy and problems of execution. Mullen could not have said it better when he declared that the U.S. messages to counter the extremist information campaign of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan lack credibility because the United States has not invested enough in building trust and relationships. He concluded that the Muslim world is a subtle world that the U.S. has not fully understood nor even attempt to understand. Only a shared appreciation of the people's culture, their needs and hopes for the future, can America hope to supplant the extremist narrative. One question that we need to ask at this juncture is whether the alien forces in Afghanistan, the U.S. and the NATO, have devoted equal resources as they are devoting to military operations there for the deeper understanding of the culture of the Afghans, for the recognition of their Morist, for the many dynamics of intertribal relations among them, for their relationship to the central government in Kabul and many others. We did not need many PhDs and political scientists or sociologists to arrive at the fairly accurate reading of a military man like Admiral Mullen about what needs to be done in Afghanistan. Indeed, nothing concentrates the mind more than the thought of the senseless loss of the young lives of American soldiers and the countless other Afghan and Afghan Pakistani civilians who become merely collateral damage in making clear what the U.S. mission in Afghanistan and elsewhere is all about. Indeed, the December summit that the G20 is contemplating does not need to happen because the diagnosis of what is wrong and what needs to be done has been made by the very men, the military men, whose lives are on the line for policies articulated and crafted in the offices in Washington, D.C., London, Berlin, and Paris. Well, why are we where we are now? Why are our lives punctuated by the everyday news to which I think we have become inert of some faraway place where Americans and other military forces are fighting yet another insurgency, another extremist group, another terrorist organization. When will this ever end? Or will our lives simply be a series of these counter-terrorism campaigns where only the names of the countries change? In the Philippines, we are asking the same question. We are challenged by the four decades old insurgency of the New People's Army, Communist Party of the Philippines with its political arm, the National Democratic Front. We are challenged by also the four decades of the Muslims in Mindanao who are seeking self-government. The more recent challenge from the Abu Sayyaf group, riding on the same self-government goal of the Moro National Liberation Front and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And we don't stop asking the question, should our military be in the forefront of these battles? Should our 120,000 armed forces of the Philippines be in the forefront of these battles? The mandate of our armed forces is to protect our country from external defense. Their mandate is not to run after kidnappers. Their mandate is not to run after criminals but it is the military who is at the forefront of these challenges. Where is the 120 Philippine National Police? In one uh, conference in uh, Washington DC, I remember two years ago, I proposed, among other things, that the armed forces of the Philippines abolish itself and render itself obsolescent. You can see, you know, the eyes widening of, of people in my audience, most of them military, by the way, and, you know, really wanting to find out why this, you know, persons 
really had made that monumental uh, proposal. And having been in the military for three and a half years at the National Defense College, I saw how our military, originally configured in the Commonwealth Act Number no. 1, is no longer or should no longer be the same military that we should have now. Why do we need 120,000 of them being supported by 55 billion pesos of our money? We should go to the University of the Philippines, to other universities, and to other social services. This is the question I asked. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago rather, I was the keynote speaker of the Philippine Air Force, Philippine Navy. Uh, they were coming one after the other, and for reasons not known to me, I was the keynote in both. And in both, I followed the same theme. Please render yourself obsolescent. I'm sure they will not invite me again. <laughs> of course, I expanded on that, telling them that, you know, because uh, the, the Air Force people were telling me that, uh, you know, they had 11 C-130s, you know, inherited from the many, many years that the Americans were there. And out of the 11, only one is flying. And that one is flying only because they are cannibalizing the rest of the 10. Okay? And here they are, you know, uh, boasting to everybody that they're protecting our Philippine airspace. Okay. I said, uh, you know, let's not have these big, big words and let us not kid ourselves and pre pretend that we can do these things. I want the Air Force to reinvent itself. I want it to be in the forefront of disaster management. That's how it's supposed to be. Uh, as, uh, because we are at peace and we are not, you know, we are not at war. And we don't need 120,000 of them to do these things. So they make a big issue of the fact that our military is building schools and is teaching the young. I said, what an expensive carpenter, you know, to, for, for, for the military, 55 billion to build schools, and what are we doing as educators? Now you're teaching our children? So where will be the, the professors uh, go if already the military is conducting, you know, what they call literacy classes in the Philippines? So this means that if you are searching for what you want to do, you know, the best thing to do is really to render yourself obsolescent. So it's not surprising as we go around our country, as we have been doing uh, in the university, our countrymen are not interested in espousing any ism or any ideology. All they want to have are very simple things, potable water so their children do not die of diarrhea, a simple roof over their heads. They want continuing opportunities for education, and they want less disruption in their lives from continuous evacuation because of military operations. These are basic things which, unfortunately, even the local governments are not able to provide. And what we see all around, that the failure of local governments to provide these basics become the fertile ground for extremism. This is not unique and discreet to the Philippines. We see in many, many insurgencies, including Afghanistan, including Pakistan and elsewhere, that the insurgencies are there where there is a failure of local government, a failure to even provide the basics. In January this year, when Barack Obama was inaugurated as the President of the United States, we expected this speech to define the broad strokes of the administration's prism of what the world should look like from a new president 